Growing up as an only child, you may not know how it feels to always have someone around you to play with. Someone that grows with you, shares the same toys, car, and in some cases, even the same clothes. A person that you spend every day with. A person that teases and praises you. A person that compliments your every flaw, and in turn, you theirs. This is a huge part of my life, and I want people to know about him. Um, I'm not just mad. I'm six six nine two two forty and six four and a little heavier than that. <laughs> nine minutes, just five hundred and forty seconds makes up the difference in age between senior Matt Costello and his twin brother John. For me, it was wonderful. My wife, there was quite a bit of concern for her. We just knew we were having two children. In fact, uh, we didn't even have two boys' names. We had two girls' names and a boy's name. But with the odds, we just said, we probably won't have another boy. Well, and so, uh, yeah, we had to make up a name after they were born. Matt would run around, antagonize, and run away. Um, Johnny would run around, he'd come up to your leg, he'd hug you, he'd smile and he'd say, I love you, Mom, and then he'd go away. Um, they were very different. I have said before that they, uh, they would antagonize each other, they would fight, but they were each other's best friend, too. And so it was a lot of fun to watch. Growing up with Jess, it was, she liked to pick on us because we were two boys, so she kind of tried to assert her dominance most of the time, and uh, I did not appreciate that very much and, and would get in fights all the time. Yeah. Only more ganged up on Matt. Matt was the, uh, the, my sister and I are much more alike, so Matt was always the uh, odd man out, so we would pick on him a lot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. From the Bay City area, Matt and John have always shared more than just a birthday and being teammates when they were growing up. The youngest of three kids, the offspring of college athletes, and the grandsons of a high school band director. Matt and John and their family have spent their whole lives finding a balance between music and sports. My father's a band director, had been a band director for 43 years um, in Corona, which is about a half hour from East Lansing. Um, I grew up as music part of our family. I never expected that our kids wouldn't go into music. It was something that was part of my life, and I just made it part of the kids, too. I think they did more trios with Jess being a trombone. They kind of had their own little jazz band going. They had to do multiple soul and ensembles um, that they would, they would all be playing together. I made them play in church because I enjoyed it. I don't think they enjoyed it, but um, I'm their mom, so I got to decide that what they were going to do. They had to sing, they had to play. Matt and John went through their young lives side by side, excelling in many things from music performance to athletics. By the time the twins got to high school, their paths eventually diverged. John, an all-state football player, traded his paths for sheet music shortly before the start of his senior season. While Matt, a future Mr. Basketball, had to come to terms with his brother's decision to walk away from a potential athletic scholarship in order to follow his passion. Matt didn't play football his sophomore year once he found out that he got a lot of attention for basketball, so he kind of picked his path. But I was, didn't really choose a, choose a path until probably right before my senior year. There's uh, up uh, North Michigan, a town called Interlochen. There's a private high school music camp, and in the summer they have a six-week program. And for the five weeks, I was still working out as much as I could, try, like getting ready for football season. And then the last week, my dad came up and I'm like, I don't think I'm gonna play football. You know, I wanna get ready for auditions. Um, and it was kind of at that point that I chose that I could have played college sports when I had fun, but I didn't want to play sports past college. So I wanted to go into something that I enjoyed just as much, but saw myself doing afterward. And I was not very happy with No, that. my whole school wasn't happy because I was, I was all state junior year and I was you know left tackle on our line. I was going to be the oldest person on the line. I was still mad at him for dumping football because um, literally I thought he was the dumbest person in the world. I, I could not understand it because I was like, you have a perfect opportunity to get your school paid for. You, you can get all the gear you want. You can be set for life. It's gonna be easy for you. Um, and he chose a saxophone. And I was like, what are you doing, man? Like, there's no money in that. But he loves it. And 
that took a while for me to come to grips with, and um, I think I think we're at a better place now where I don't mm. aren't as mad at you anymore. He only makes comments every so often. Their senior year, John chose not to play football, and um, his his knees were hurting him. Uh, but one of the things he did choose to do, he chose to play basketball uh, because his brother was going to be playing. He knew that would be the last time to play a team sport besides track. They knew they would do that together. Uh, the thing that also surprised us besides John's decision was that uh, Matt decided to rejoin band. He had stopped being in band his junior year, and he rejoined band to join John for their senior year. With the close of one chapter of their lives upon them, John and Matt would soon be heading to college. And for the first time, the two wouldn't be living under the same roof. In high school, when we'd hang out, um, everyone thought we were like the same person. We obviously thought we were two very different people. But in high school, what I didn't realize is that my flaws were covered by his strengths and his flaws were covered by my strengths. So like the example I was always given is, you know, we would, if we ever went to a new place, we would walk in, I don't like approaching new people. So Matt would just be like, hey, like we need to find this place. How do we do this? Matt can't remember anything. So he would ask, how do I get here? And I would listen and then I would drive to where we were going. You know, and then once Matt was gone freshman year, I then had to become more assertive so that I could figure out where to go, you know, and fill in those gaps where, you know, you don't really realize that if you grow up as an only child, you have to take care of all that or you just have flaws that you can't get by. You know, and that was very interesting to realize that we were really just one functional person walking around together. And then once we split, we then had to try and fill in those gaps. So it was, it was very strange to learn, but it, we've, I, I see how we've both grown into now our own functional human being. I think it's been good that they're at the same school. They've, uh, they've been able to support each other, and when they've needed to just kind of um, download, they've been able to call on each other to, uh, to have that support, that comfort from home. Um, but it's been very, um, very weird to watch the different paths they've taken. Um, like we've talked about, uh, you know, on one night we'll come to see Matt play. We'll see him in the middle of the Breslin, everyone's cheering, clapping, he's out in front of the TV, he's making stupid faces or dancing down the court. Um, and then within a half an hour after we've left Matt, we'll go see John and we've known he has spent the same time that Matt's been out in the limelight. He'll be down in a practice room all by himself where no one knows where he's at. And we get to see both ends of the spectrum of what our kids are doing. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing. It's what they've both chosen. It's just um, very different to see the paths that both of them have taken. Well, the funny thing is, like everybody else, I don't know a lot about it because it's kind of one of those things that's been, um, his brother's been great, really supportive. Matt cares about him. His, his brother can sing and do other things. and. Uh, but I think it speaks more about their whole family. You know, the family's important in the Costello organization. And, uh, you know, I, I know uh, Matt thinks the world of his brother, and I know his brother kind of enjoys the thing Matt can do, but they support each other. When his brother has a function going on, Matt's there. And of course, uh, John is always at Matt's functions and uh, kind of a neat relationship. You know, the biggest difference is that he, you know, performs for people weekly, you know, where I perform, I've, I have one performance for people, you know, on my own for the whole semester. So like, that's the difference. But when it comes to like the effort we're putting into, into stuff, like the biggest reason we don't see each other is just our schedules are different. So he's up at probably 6 a.m. most of the time. I wake up at 11, but stay up till 2 a.m., you know, doing my stuff. And I think growing up doing both, um, both of us were forced into athletics, both of us were forced into music. That kind of gives us appreciation like I've never questioned his work ethic in music because I understand the amount of time it goes into and I would say I would understand it even more than him because I absolutely hated it so and I was still forced to do it um, where with basketball I kind of en I enjoyed playing and I think flip side for him um, he didn't enjoy going out on the court with me uh, in the summer playing one-on-one -on -one. he uh, he loathed it and he cheated I did not cheat he cheated I did all not the time. cheat he he understands 
where I'm putting my work in. So there's never really an argument like that. While Matt's performance on the court this season has garnered attention from the Izzone and MSU fans, his reactions and antics after big plays have been almost as popular as his stat lines. My dad showed us, he pulled out a video, he's like, here's your brother's latest video. And it's just of all this stupid stuff. You know, just when he picked Tom Izzo up too, it's like, Everyone's like, oh, it's so funny. I'm like, he's done that for a decade. You know, we've both picked all our coaches up. You know, I, I've always been a little more reserved when it comes to celebration, but Matt's always been an idiot. The first time I saw Matt's stupid dance was during a basketball game their senior year when um, he and John were playing together and he was feeding John multiple plays in a row. And he got so excited because his brother was just chewing up one of the teams and just, and he was helping. They're playing like a two-man game. And it was like the fourth time in a row and Matt comes running down the court because doing that stupid jumping, foot dancing thing because of his brother. And he was more excited, I think, for his brother than anything he ever did. Through the ups and downs of growing up as brothers and going to the same college, as a Division I athlete and an elite musician, the Costello twins still make time to talk, touch base, and support each other. This is a huge part of my life, and I want people to know about him. Um, I'm not just Matt, it's Matt and John. Like, we've always grown up together, always done everything together, and he's gonna be the best man at my wedding. I'm gonna live with him for the next 60 years, calling him, talking to him, figuring out life. I'm gonna need him to play with my kids for me and like just say, tell him to chill out. Um, be that uncle and bad boys too. Yeah. Bringing out the guns. <laughs> but he's huge. Part of my life. And I wouldn't want anybody else to be in this position. I tell my wife every day, you know, we wouldn't live in the house we live in or have the cottage we have or probably the lifestyle we have if it wasn't for uh, those five, six, seven guys we got from that city. Flint, Michigan. 45 minutes away from the Breslin Center and quite possibly one of the most important places for Coach Tom Izzo. When news broke of lead contamination in Flint's drinking water, Michigan State University took a vested interest in the community as a whole. But Coach Izzo has taken the issue personally and has been quick to lend a hand in any way possible. So we got some work to do, I guess. We got to figure out not only all these water bottles and uh, we're going to have fresh water we're gonna get those doggone pipes fixed. We're gonna get things straightened out here somehow, some way. But if you just look at all those bottles and times it by thousands and thousands, we got a way to recycle it so that we can reuse them so they're not laying around everywhere. And that's kind of what we're gonna to try to do today. Rip it where it's perforated. Take the bag, take the note card, Staple it, and then we're gonna roll it up. Numerous generous donors have supplied water to the Flint community, but now another concern has surfaced. What does the city do with the empty water bottles? In a community where only 10% of residents recycle, that question provided an opportunity for the team to help out and inform Flint residents. While half of the team created bags and packets to give to families when they pick up water, the other half worked with students to create posters and flyers promoting recycling. That place, you know, when we won the national championship, we had a parade here. We had a separate parade in Flint. That key to that city is still in my trophy case, you know, and always will be. But there was a much bigger part than that, and the bigger part than that is um, appreciating what other people go through that don't have it as good as we do here in Disneyland. And, and uh, making sure our players, who some of them had it rougher than that, but make sure they don't forget where they came from and they give back to the people who need help. Uh, I think that was uh, my mission on that day. Like Dennis, don't you got Danny Valentine on your team? Denzel, yeah. Yeah, I forgot it was Denzel Valentine. Yeah, he's yeah, the good, isn't he? got one point last time. I know, I'm not ashamed. I was mad. Yeah, me too. Kids got you, Kyle? Are you guys taking care of Kyle? Micah just finished the lobby hall. Lobby hall. 
Not bad. They're pretty good. I heard we're cleaning up in the other room. Yeah, you guys, you guys look pretty good here. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. This has been awesome. Yeah, well, thanks for what you do. I wanted to get up there for weeks. It just, their schedule was so brutal. Well, it's, it's not good that one day off you, you drag them back on a, on a bus and, and go somewhere. Zero resistance, zero complaining. Uh, we went up there and, and when I watched my guys with those kids at the Boys and Girls Club, I said, this was a good move. Not real happy day for me, you know, we lost a tough game to Purdue. This was a good move. This is really what it's all about. And uh, when you see all the water bottles, when you see the, the things, when you see the little kids, when you see some of them scared, not knowing what's going on, some of them a little better, when you see everybody kind of banding together um, to bring this city back and to get it back where it belongs, it's gonna take a hell of a team effort. And that's what we're all about, team. And here we sit with five league losses, three by one point. And you can have them back, and you'd like to have them back, and this is the one we wish we could have back, the game up in Madison. A game we lost by a single point. First meeting went to Wisconsin by a point. Reports hands a three to open play. To Nigel Hayes, fires a three out front, no. Rebound Valentine, Denzel's on the move. Long pass to Costello, up, and it's in. Valentine for Harris, for three. Bounces back in the backcourt to Valentine. Working on the A's, takes in the base, and oh my goodness, here comes a long jump shot by Deontay Davis. How about that? Valentine running the point where Leonard was so awesome. Go. Not there. Forbes for three. Seven assists for Denzel Valentine. This one to Forbes. Valentine hands the three. He's been involved either assist or made field goal on every made shot for Michigan State. He sprinted off that screen. Brent Forbes sprinted, sprinted first. Valentine second, got wide open. Nigel Hayes couldn't keep up. Give and go down low. Forbes to Schilling, who slammed it. Well, wow, that was just pretty ball movement. Nice pass by Forbes to Schilling. Forbes off the curl. Oh, my. <laughs> Valentine looks like he's not to be stopped tonight. <laughs> looks like he's just. It's like there's nine guys out here, and then there's Valentine playing. Only two out of six in the field in this game. So it's now 32-25 Michigan State. Davis has it out front now to Forbes coming off the pick. Here's a three ball. He got it. Well, he started the first half with a three, starts the second with a three. So he's got 11. That's the 20th time that Brent Forbes has been in double digits. Played in the shot clock, and Davis resets it. Harris trailing for three. Huge, not only the effort on the backboard, but huge that Harris gets going. Look, Harris is a guy that can go get you 20. With 15-15 to go in the game, Michigan State leading at 43-29. Valentine jump shot from the elbow. Little step back to nothing but that. I love the way he created space there against the big man half and a nice two for Valentine. So he has 11, that's double digits, 20 straight times for the guy. Forbes waiting for it and cut it. Perfect example of reading the defense, not looking at the ball. Largest lead for Michigan State. Michigan State leading Wisconsin, 12-30 left. Valentine has it, goes right down, misses the scoop shot, but the follow-up dunk was awfully nice by Davis. Davis's man had to help on the drive, left it wide open for that jam.
Harris snaps off a two-point jumper, foot on the line. Stolen by Harris. Valentine! <laughs> 17 points, nine assists, five rebounds. And now the big guy's getting in the act, Colby Wallenman off the bench, who spent his time a couple of weeks ago visiting med schools. Smartest guy in the building. You know he will not miss any assignments. Valentine has it. He goes down the lane, floaters away, good! Two more for Valentine. Good game by Valentine, good game by Michigan State, not so good by Wisconsin. Didn't play hard. Season low five for Nigel Hayes. 12 point win for Michigan State to go to 22 and five and nine and five in the Big Ten.